All right, well, we can go ahead and uh, get started with some of the front matter while uh, folks are, are kind of streaming in. Uh, it's a pleasure today to uh, present at our BSUG. Thank you very much to IBIPSA for um, helping advertise this. And uh, if you're an IBIPSA member and you're new to the IDL, well, welcome. Uh, we, we are a, a research branch of the University of Idaho's Art and Architecture program. We're not trying to compete with any private consultants or anything like that. We're just an educational institution. Um, and we're, we're really kind of dedicated towards buildings and, and how they use energy. And we do a fair amount of simulation. Uh, and because we do, uh, Idaho Power helps sponsor this lecture series. They also help sponsor a few other programs specifically for the local area here. So if you're an Idaho Power customer, a couple of good things to note today. One, you're eligible for an attendance prize. Um, and two is that uh, we also offer additional technical design assistance. So if you are working on a new project or a retrofit uh, or a new energy model, and you might need a little bit of help on that, uh, well, we are, here to help um, and anything up to you know four thousand dollars worth of our time which is grad students and professors so we're cheap um, Idaho Power will will help help pay for that um, beyond four thousand dollars there's a cost share um, but if you have more information uh, more questions on that we can give you more information um, just reach out to us there's an online form uh, you can email us uh, or also reach out to Idaho Power so this is our last BSUG of the spring, but we've got more coming up this fall uh, that I'm really excited about. Um, August 25th, we'll have a guest speaker talking about uh, 2D heat transfer with Grasshopper. Uh, by September, we should have our luminaire level lighting controls installed here in our office. And so we hope to do a demonstration of that. Uh, and then October 27th, I hope to have our, our previous director, Elizabeth Cooper back here to give a, a talk on indoor air quality in the time of COVID while she's finishing up her PhD on that at University College of London. So congrats to her on that. We also have uh, tools that are available for you to check out. If you're familiar with our energy resource library, uh, you should know that we've got some new tools on the block. Uh, we've got some Vuzix glasses if you need to do an energy audit, even if you're at a distance, um, somebody on site can wear these, we can ship them out and you can be connected live via Zoom through that and see whatever the building operator sees. We've got some ozone monitors, uh, now that people are thinking more about ionization in buildings, uh, a, a new uh, flow hood to measure HVAC performance, uh, lots, lots of goodies, some Bluetooth data loggers so you don't have to plug into the EMS system. Um, so check out our website, uh, fill out the form if you want one, and then we can also help train you on how to use it in case you're not sure which tool you need, but we can help diagnose that. So in addition to uh, those programs that Idaho Power supports through the Integrated Design Lab, we also have, uh, I should say Idaho Power also has a separate commercial and industrial energy efficiency program. So that offers incentives for retrofits, um, designing energy efficient new construction projects, major renovations. Um, those could include additions, expansions, changing the use of the space, like a warehouse converted over to a brewery, um, adding a load to a space, like adding an AC unit when the space was formally in condition. Uh, a lot of incentives out there uh, available to you. Uh, there's a new program rollout coming June 15th, I believe. And uh, Sheree, I saw you were on here. Uh, feel free to interrupt me and, and correct me if any of these uh, numbers have changed. But I believe right now the professional assist, uh, assistance incentive, which is separate from that technical design assistance we were talking about earlier, um, is doubled. So up to 20%, uh, up to $5,000 per project. Um, Sheree, did you wanna mention anything else on that? If not, I will move on to the heart of the matter today. Um, so thanks all for joining. Um, if I didn't mention it before, um, I'm Damon Woods. I'm interim director here at the Integrated Design Lab. 
And over the last year uh, with Idaho Power, we worked on some weather normalization tools and I'm excited to get to share those with you. What, what do I mean by weather normalization? Um, for this presentation, I'm gonna keep it at a fairly narrow context because it could go a lot of different directions. And because we've got so many people online and it could go any which way, um, I'd ask that you just hold your questions to the end or feel free to type them into the chat, but I will not be checking the chat until the end of the presentation. I'll leave about 10 to 15 minutes at the end so we can really dive into more details or, or more resources. Um, but I really wanna just kind of share with you some available tools that allow you to look at building consumption history and see whether uh, a change that you made had a big impact on the energy consumption uh, or whether that was just a, a, a weather pattern that happened through. So how, how do we get to that? How do we understand whether it was just a, an unseasonably warm summer that caused our AC use to spike or if we just forgot to set the thermostat back? I think there's three keys um, and I'm kind of structuring my talk today around these three points is making sure we get the building history right, getting the weather history right, and then using appropriate graphics to really tell a compelling story. Um, and, you know, some of these weather normalization tools are available through say an energy management system or another software that overlays it like SkySpark. And those are wonderful tools. Um, and this is not to replace those necessarily. Um, this is for those sites that might not have it, either because it's a, a small customer or um, the client has an EMS system, but it hasn't been recording data or functioning particularly well for a while. Um, so today is gonna be talking about some more of those like basic tools that can fill in the gaps um, and or are free or cheaper than what you might uh, encounter through like um, a subscription service through like a Honeywell or, or Siemens. So the first point uh, that I'll, I'll talk about is making sure we get our building history right. So one thing we have to figure out is, you know, getting the correct electricity consumption, getting those bills in, um, and understanding exactly what the different fuel mixes are at the site and how that place is being heated or cooled. Is, the, is there gas on the site? If so, is there a large furnace and we should expect a large rise during the winter? Or is the gas only used for say service water heating? In which case, weather's not gonna have as much of an impact on that consumption. The other thing to make sure that you're taking note of is how has the building changed in terms of use over the last year? Uh, I'll talk about throwing out uh, outliers and anomalies later on. I feel like 2020, the whole year is just gonna be one big outlier in terms of building consumption. Um, so uh, that, that's gonna be interesting, but how did occupancy change uh, during COVID or did a new tenant come in? Even if it wasn't like an occupancy change or major equipment changing, perhaps there is a new facility manager who is trying to do things in a new or a different way. And so it's important to keep note of when those changes might have taken place so that as you do that weather normalization, you can um, isolate those incidents and then see what effect some of those changes might have. All right, so um, first things first, uh, we need to get weather his, um, building history downloaded. Uh, one tool that we use here at our lab, and uh, I will say it is uh, very specific to uh, our area because this is based on Idaho Power. Um, but let me, hopefully you can see my screen. Um, one set of data that we get from uh, uh, a request for um, you know building usage history over time if the, the client signs a disclosure uh, is a file that looks like this uh, where you've got your hourly consumption um, broken out into kind of this table and we've set up this uh, template if you will to take this information um, you can change the date range here and it will automatically format that this data into hourly uh, daily, 
monthly. Um, so, so you can get kilowatt hours per month and then graph that information. Uh, so you can see trend lines over the course of a year uh, or even a couple of years. I think I've got um, templates in here up to 10 years worth of data. We've also got this little slider in here. Uh, and you know, maybe you personally don't need this, but I think it can be helpful for uh, you know, calibrating some of your energy models and things like that to see, okay, why, why is my usage off in this particular month? Uh, and then diving down further, okay, let's, let's look at a couple weeks worth of data. Um, and you can use this kind of scroll bar if you want to um, switch from one week to the next. It takes a second to update because I'm running many Excel files on my computer right now. Um, but you can see how the usage changed week to week. Um, not accounting for weather here, just looking at building energy consumption. And then diving down specifically into one week um, or, or just a few days to see the, the difference between a weekday and a weekend. Um, the, the, the formulas are, are all built into this and you're welcome to use it. Um, or you can just, if you want, um, copy and paste the data into this data tab and everything else auto-calculates. Um, so that's helpful for folks that might be here in the area. I know power customers that are, are here designing buildings in that area. Um, if you want that spreadsheet, you know, let, let me know. Like I said, we're free resource. Um, so that can be helpful for, you know, electricity consumption. It's a little more challenging to get gas or propane consumption at that same hourly uh, uh, increment. And so um, that's, that's when it's great to have an EMS, but if you don't have that, then we might be looking more at say monthly data. Um, and the spreadsheet is kind of one way to quickly get from hourly over to monthly. So you can import that into some of the other templates that we use that I'll be talking about later. Um, the, the, the heart of the presentation today is, is really on weather history, right? We as simulationists probably know how to get building history. So um, let's let's dive into how we can how we can get some of that weather data. Uh, as as you all know, um, at least I hope, uh, as your um, simulationists, there's two types of weather history, right? We've got actual historical files and then typical historical trends. Uh, so you've got your AMY actual meteorological year file, which will be tied to a specific date range. Uh, as well as heating degree days and cooling degree days where you can go into NOAA um, and get some of that data versus your typical weather files, your typical meteorological year, which is what your Energy Plus, your Do2, your eQuest are, are running, um, as well as say maybe bin data that you might be getting from ASHRAE or even design day files are based on this typical history, uh, not necessarily uh, you know the actual month of January 2019, say. All right, so where do we get some of this stuff? In terms of AMY sources, um, there's uh, a, a variety of resources and I feel like they're getting better and better each month. Um, one uh, that was uh, fairly new to me is the localized actual meteorological year file creator, LAF. Uh, this was published in July of 2019 out of University of Utah with funding from the National Science Foundation. Uh, I've, I've put links in here for each of these uh, and I'll post a PDF of this presentation or rather I should say Dylan Agnes, who's kind of our, our technical website overlord here, um, will be posting this PDF uh, on our uh, YouTube page um, and our, our VSEC page where you can access an archive of uh, all of our guest speakers and, and all of our topics. So these, these links um, will, will be available to you. To, you don't have to necessarily take a screen capture now, um, but feel free to do that too. Um, but it's, it's open source, it's, it's free. One of the challenges with LAF is that it doesn't necessarily incorporate uh, solar radiation data. That one's a bit of a challenge. 
but you can bring in say a TMY file and make some edits to it and uh, create your own based on uh, historical sources. And it's got an easy download for the Mesa West uh, uh, data uh, that you can kind of download with a click, which is pretty nice. Uh, so a link to that publication and that software there, which you can download from GitHub. There's also Elements out of Big Ladder. Uh, they run the Great Forum Unmet Hours. Uh, they collaborated with uh, Rocky Mountain Institute on creating uh, this program, which is another GUI, I think it's on Java, um, whereas LAF it runs on Python. Um, both of them have user interfaces, which is great. Um, and you can, similar to LAF, uh, click and download and, and modify typical uh, typical meteorological years and adapt them to be actual meteorological years. Um, and it's got some links on where you can access some of that data. If that is just too much work for you, you can also just purchase. There are a couple companies out there, um, you know, white box technologies is one. Uh, I think weather source might be another. Um, and these, files, you can say, I need this specific location and this specific date range, and that'll run you anywhere between, say, $15 to $100, maybe $75 or so might be the average. Um, and that can be a great option, too. Um, I, I put a link there to uh, a few, um, you know, I don't want to give advertising to one over another, um, but a, a few different companies and resources off of the DOE EERE exchange. Um, you can also just do it yourself. And I'll be talking about how to do that today, um, collecting either monthly or hourly data from NOAA. Uh, there's also some great plugins that you can use, uh, you know, through the Grasshopper Rhino platform uh, with Ladybug tools to access and download and format some of that data. Um, or you can, uh, you know, create your own script um, and access information on say Weather Underground. Uh, there are a few other APIs out there. I, I used to be a big fan of the Dark Sky API and I had a little R script that I would have loved to share with you all um, as soon as I got it published um, that could go and collect all that information and process it all um, with the click of a button. Unfortunately, Apple overlords bought them and uh, that API is no longer available. But there's similar sites out there if you're willing to put in the programming time and you don't have access to say uh, Ladybug um, or Elements or, or Laugh are, are just not doing what, what you need them to. Um, in terms of just like kind of a simple method of going out and capturing hourly historical data, um, I, I did give a link in there to the NOAA site and it's a, NOAA is a, a huge website. Um, it's a government resource, um, which is a blessing and a curse. Um, it's, it's free and it's so big that it's really hard to dive down to specifically what you need. Um, thankfully, I uh, have talented graduate students here, um, Teus Mitchell and Jason Talford, who really helped on this, um, particularly Teus Mitchell. I'm, I'm uh, stealing his thunder here a bit, I should, I should mention. Um, but he, you know, went out, found exactly the area where you need to go on the NOAA website um, and how to um, go and access that information. So you can go to like their map tool, select the specific station, and then you have to add it to your cart, which makes it seem like you have to purchase something. It, you don't, it's free. Um, you just have to enter your email. And then there's like a five minute turnaround between when you hit submit order um, so you can get up and get a cup of coffee and come back to your computer. And it should have um, a little CSV file that's uh, available for you. That's localized climate data. Um, and then that CSV data, um, it's, it's great because it's there, but you have to do some post-processing on it. You have to clean it up a little bit. Maybe that means some of their dates are coming in as a, a text and you need to convert that over into an actual date format so you can index it correctly. Uh, sometimes there's little an anomalies in there. There's gaps, uh, little NAs in there. So um, I make sure that um, the, the number of rows that I have is equal to the number of hours that I'm expecting to get. 
right? So for a year, if I'm looking at hourly data, that's 8,760. And if I'm at like 8,740 something, then I know there's a problem and I really need to figure out where that um, 30 hour gap is uh, so that I am not um, about to normalize to something that doesn't exist, right? Um, or I get like a, a January confused with say um, yeah, July or something like that. So it takes a little bit of post-processing, um, although generally I found it to be not, not too challenging. Um, what's, what's a lot easier and what takes um, uh, less energy to do is, is to grab the monthly history. Uh, let me just cruise over to their website really quick. Um, so you can go onto their website, uh, click on a state or an area, and it should my internet connection is good enough. There we go. Um, take you over to this site, and this is just w2.weather.gov. Go to now data. Come on, computer, you can do this. Um, and then uh, get um, monthly summarized data. You can enter your year range and your variable. Um, and here is where we collect our heating degree days and our cooling degree days, um, base of, of 65. You just click go and it pops up this um, lovely table, which you can just copy and paste um, into um, a, another kind of Excel template or modify it however you need. So you can um, see over time, uh, whether this was a particularly warm or a particularly cold, uh, say, uh, um, December or January. Um, you can see the means down here. And then uh, if you want to do some of your own post-processing, kind of do some percentage differences between, um, you know, December of 2011 versus the mean, um, something like that. Um, so um, just know that that is another free resource that is out there. There's also, of course, typical meteorological year sources. Um, you can purchase some of these from ASHRAE uh, through their bookstore. Uh, they also offer um, design day information for pretty much any site. Um, actually, let me just switch back over to my browser. So they've got um, ashrae-medio.info. Uh, and if you right click anywhere on this map, it will show me the nearest weather stations to wherever I clicked. Um, and so I'm in Boise, so I'm just going to select Boise Airport for now. And if I scroll down outside of the map, my bad, scroll down here, come on, computer. Um, I can see my uh, design conditions here. Um, my say 99%, uh, 99.6%. Oh boy, my computer is really lagging. My apologies to the online audience. Um, as well as you know um, your uh, other information on that site. One thing that I found interesting looking at this is you can change the year that you're specifying up here at the top. If my scroll bar will go there, come on, there we go. Um, so it's got 2017 data, 2013 and um, 2009, you know, just going with the ASHRAE handbook cycles. It's really interesting in Boise to see how the design day conditions have changed between 2009 and 2017. The um, dry bulb temperature, the, the, um, the cooling degree days have, um, Cooling degree temperature has, has gone up uh, a few degrees, but what's really changed is our um, minimum winter temperature. It's changed by about six degrees here over the course of eight years. Um, so we you know, don't need to oversize our, our systems nearly as much. Okay, so that's ASHRAE. Um, there's of course Energy Plus. You can download TMY3s um, for, for anywhere. Uh, pretty user-friendly website. 
And then I like to use Climate Consultant as well. Um, and all Climate Consultant does is it just accesses the same energyplus.net um, slash weather site. Um, because when you download a TMY3 file and open it in a text editor, it looks hideous, right? Um, the, these are, are really horrible looking files. It's, it's hard to tell exactly which column is doing which thing. Um, so that's why I use Climate Consultant. It's a free tool out of UCLA and it's a, a 30 second process to export a TMY3 uh, into a, a, a more usable format or to extract particular bits of data. There are also built-in tools in Energy Plus that can do this as well, as well as Elements and Laugh, those can do that too. I use Climate Consultant just because I'm familiar with it um, and because it's it's quick for me. But if you're using one of those other programs, it can also be an option. But all you have to do is open up a new project, load in your .epw file, um, which is you know usually a, a TMY3, and then go to export weather data from the file. And you can select your variables and the frequency at which you want those to be reported. Um, so this is kind of what I use to develop, say, like a, a bin analysis of a particular site. Um, so if I slide back over to my next slide, um, once I extract that TMY data, um, I've got another template, which we will also post on our website. Uh, let me pull that up right now. Here we go. Uh, so when I download data directly, in this case, it was Pocatello because I had a project over there. Um, it, it comes out looking in this format where you've got columns for month, day, hour, and then your dry bulb temperature. Um, but usually what I want to see is bin data, um, especially if I'm looking at a new technology or trying to do some heat pump curves or something like that based on um, if, if the manufacturer data is given in uh, different temperature bins. Uh, so I've got this little formula built in here. So anytime I want, I can paste in raw data into this first tab and in the second tab, it automatically calculates my maximum temperature, my minimum temperature, and then um, I've got my little degree bins here. Uh, so the, the formula that I use, it's pretty simple. It's um, just count ifs. And I'm looking at the data in my first tab. So you can see it's just about 8,760 data points, which is good, plus a couple extra for the headers, right? And if that is greater than or equal to, um, you know, if it's in between these two temperatures, essentially. One thing I, I had to remember, um, and I feel like I have to Google this every time I pull this up, is I, you have to add the little and symbol. Uh, in order for this formula to reference an active cell that's going to slide down as you um, drag and drop this formula. Um, but the nice thing is you can create custom bins, whether that is, you know, for one degrees, two degrees, five degrees, 10 degrees, um, whether you want that for just one month or an entire year. Um, usually I'm looking at an entire year. And so, um, uh, let me switch back over to my presentation. And the reason that I do that is so that I can, um, you know, do some bin analysis on, on particular pieces of technology, or if I've got an engineer that just really wants to see bin data for this particular site, um, then that can be helpful, but it can also create some really good graphics. And graphics are something that I feel like I, as an engineer, need to do better on. Um, most of the time. We've had some, some great staff here at the IDL over the years. Um, Jacob Dunn, who now helps run Project Stasio, uh, Lauren Helmley, others uh, who really were able to tell good stories um, with, with numbers, right? Because if you just spout out different numbers, clients' eyes start to glaze over, right? Um, I know this from personal experience, um, teaching thermodynamics, and you can just see that instant when, when students go from engaged to just like, oh, no, that's just too much. I'm just not here anymore, right? Um, maybe that's happening faster and faster now that we're just like all over the place um, and, and COVID's rough. And maybe you're doing that right now with this presentation. Hopefully not, but we'll get into some pretty pictures. Um, so there are simple things that you can do. Um, even just color coding 
can make a difference. I know that sounds elementary, um, but it makes such a difference for me being able to just feel what these numbers are trying to convey. If I code the heating as red and the cooling as blue, um, and then if I also create, say, little uh, gaps at the tops of these to see, you know, where my savings are and exactly, you know, how big that block is going to be, um, and I'm not getting a false perspective uh, from like here to down here. Um, so once again, another uh, Excel template that I've got here that we can post on our website. Um, at this point, um, that's not the one that I want to use, energy use chart template. Here we go, it's just taking a second to pop up. There we go. Um, and let me move my mouse over here. So you've got you know, your basic pie charts, um, which can be helpful, um, but we can, we can do better than that as, as building engineers and simulationists. So you can use a stacked donut if you want. So this is looking at um, you know, a baseline, versus a couple of different upgrades. And you can see how the heating might change from one to the next. The other thing that I like to do is I like to uh, stack columns uh, and then create goals. So if you just go into, um, let me see if I can um, format data, data series. I like creating outlines for different things, and then doing series overlaps uh, and transparencies with, with data so that I can see not only how it's actually performing, but I can see it versus what I'm hoping to get to, whether that's like a target line uh, or what my model says should have happened. Um, these are just little, little Excel tricks if you want, um, you know, just use this transparency line, change the fill color, um, change the data type um, from a fill to uh, no fill, and then just having a border, um, change that border type to, uh, you know, uh, dashed if you want. Uh, this is another template that will be um, available on our website. Uh, Dylan is probably um, very frustrated with me right now because I forgot to give him this um, to post on our website. We have some other things on there, which I'll show at the end. Um, and Dylan, I, I apologize. It's just my absent-minded professorness. I'm not, I'm not trying to make your life miserable, but we have some fun things to add to our website. Um, so if you just want to steal, straight up steal these templates, great. Um, you know, that's, that's what we're here for. Um, and like I mentioned, you know, having these little blocks in here to really quantify savings and to show that, you know, make sure that um, this one series is showing up so you can see the actual EUI or maybe percent difference. Maybe add a secondary axis on here so you can see how the savings changes from one to the next. Just something to make it, you know, a little more compelling, right? Um, so, um, you know, visualizing consumption history can be really helpful, but so can plotting weather history. So um, this is a very simple visualization of that bin analysis that I was just walking through from um, Pocatello. In this case, uh, I was looking at McCall and um, just doing um, five degree temperature bins and looking at the hours in each and doing a little histogram. You know, you can get fancy, you can use pivot tables, you can use, um, you know, all sorts of features just trying to show you a few basic ones that, that we use. But once you look at this uh, data, sure you can see the numbers over here, but to me, this is just much more meaningful of seeing, hey, if I'm designing a building in McCall, almost half the time it's, it's colder than freezing there. Um, and so if I, am, uh, if I have a building with a balance point temperature at say um, 65, I'm gonna be spending, a a large part of my uh, energy use on heating that building. So let's try and lower that building's balance point temperature as much as we can to be more in line with what's actually happening at the site. So, um, you know, it can provide context and really design emphasis and maybe an argument for more insulation for, um, with the clients or um, looking at maybe a different HVAC type that's more suited to say cooling than heating. 
uh, depending on that particular um, instance. All right, so that's kind of visualizing building consumption on one side, weather history on another side, how do we bring those together and start um, normalizing for that. Um, so, um, you know, getting back to that first question, was that just an unseasonably warm summer that caused our electricity to spike or is there something else that's happening there? So um, one, one spreadsheet that we've got, um, which is on our website currently, and you can download it now, uh, is our weather normalization spreadsheet. And what we did was we, we broke up the consumption into its component parts, whether that be electricity or natural gas, it could also be propane or even geothermal uh, for buildings in Boise that are on our geothermal network. Um, because each one is gonna respond to changes in weather a little bit differently. And then we separated them even further into uh, heating season, versus um, cooling season. So we've got our cooling degree days and you can see our electricity use at this um, particular demonstration site, you know, had a pretty clear linear trend. Um, whereas with heating, yes, it goes up a little bit as our heating degree days increase. Um, so maybe there's more fan energy usage, but it's not the same slope and it's a, um, a, a different, uh, relationship that's happening between the heating degree days and the cooling degree days. Even just using a, a simple linear estimation program within Excel, um, adding a trend line, you can see um, what that equation might be, how good of a fit it is, and if there are particular anomalies, um, little outliers that might stand out. Like I said, we did this not only for electricity, but also for gas, because that's gonna have a, a you know, uh, different um, way of interacting with weather depending on the type of heating system that you've got there. And so it's, it's kind of a way of breaking down um, building energy signatures. Um, I, I know those have been out there for a while. Um, so let me just um, pull up what that spreadsheet actually looks like. So we can really dive into it. And where did it go? Come on. Here we go. Um, and let's go to the introduction. So Teus and I worked on this last year. Um, Jason's working on making this kind of look nicer, a little more user friendly. So big shout out to both of them on this. Um, there's this kind of introduction that shows you the links and the actual steps to go through this process. Um, but it just starts once again with collecting building consumption data and weather history data, right? Um, the things that, that we just talked about. So you can copy and paste and enter those values into the, the yellow cells, um, you know, change the uh, dates as needed. And then you grab your heating degree days and your cooling degree days from that NOAA site, that table that uh, I was showing to you earlier. Um, the, best part of this spreadsheet, I think, is really the output figures and trying to um, convey this information in a very clear and simple way so you get this emotional reaction or at least a sense of, of what might be happening to this building over time. Um, so we have the actual use each year. Um, in the solid colors. And then we have outlines for what we would have expected uh, based on the linear estimations, um, those trend lines that we just showed. So those regressions um, are back here. You can go and look at them if you want. And each project, of course, is gonna be unique. Uh, each building's gonna respond to the weather a little bit differently depending on where it's located, the HVAC system that's there, um, it's you know thermal energy storage within the envelope. And so uh, these regressions automatically generate based on the data that you just enter in. Um, and then these equations are then used to kind of predict, okay, um, you know, let's 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 normalize for for this particular weather pattern. Yes, it was an unseasonably warm. July 
and we would expect it to have you know this much impact on our overall consumption. Um, you are welcome to go through and, and analyze the calculated values. One thing that the regression visualiz visualization is helpful for is identifying some of these outliers. And so if you say, hey, I, I know that we had a really bad, um, you know, February of 2018 because somebody forgot to uh, reset our thermostat or the valve on our boiler was open in a way that it shouldn't have been. So that is not typical of our consumption. Well, you can go and then find that point and uh, delete that from your data so you can get a, a better regression. It is manual. Um, I'm sure there are more um, automated ways you can do this if you're an Excel master and want to do your own macros or um, find some outlier features. For me, uh, I like just being able to visually identify it um, before I have a program take that information away from me um, so that you can really kind of dive down into it. All right, so let's look at some of the output figures. And these, like I said, just automatically generate as soon as you enter in your data. And I, I, I really, um, I'm, I'm proud of the way that it's kind of broken up in between the heating season and the cooling season so that you can see uh, whether the, um, you know, summer gas use might have been much higher in 2019 than was expected. And if we're using a lot of gas during the summer, that's probably not a good sign, right? Um, maybe something has changed in the buildings. Maybe we've taken out all these incandescents and replaced them with LEDs and we've got a much higher heating load. But during the summertime, that makes maybe less sense. Um, maybe a piece of equipment got swapped out, but these are the things that you can start investigating and um, that building owners and facility managers can quickly latch onto and say, hey, I think I know what might be causing this. Um, this, is, this is not getting full on Sherlock Holmes into all the nitty gritty details. Um, this is just a, hey, that's unusual. We should look there uh, for a potential low hanging fruit or something that we can change uh, within our building operations to start saving some energy. Um, you can look at it, you know, broken down uh, winter gas use, heating gas use, summer electricity use, winter electricity use, as well as just combine it all. Um, and then see your energy usage in terms of what's expected uh, versus what's actually happening based on, um, you know, those, those weather normalizations based on linear regressions. Like I said, very simple. Um, regressions, right? And they're not perfectly accurate, especially if you've got more outliers. As you get into the hourly data, we've also got an hourly spreadsheet out there. We need a bit more I think, quality control. I'd say it's still in the, the development phase of, of research and development. Um, we've been using it internally a bit, but I'd like to tidy it up before we post that on our website. Um, but, but it gives you kind of a, a sense of okay, over time, is, is my building doing better or is it doing worse, right? Um, and that's really what we wanna get at. And that's kind of the, the point of weather normalization. And um, so anyway, just, just a few tools out there that are available to you. Um, let me go to our website um, to kind of show off what Dylan has been doing here. So if you just go to idealboise.com uh, under, uh, services and then design tools. Uh, my scrolling is, is gonna be a bit slow here, um, but we have not only this weather normalization tab, so yeah, um, services um, and design tools, which is where I'm at right now. So just hover over these, so you'll get to that little drop down menu. Um, there is a note here that we are continuing to improve and post new tools. Uh, like some of those templates that I was showing you earlier. Um, we've also got links to say, you know, the, the daylight pattern guide um, that uh, Chris Meek and Kevin Van Den Weimelenberg helped develop. Um, you know, some CBEX micro data visualization tools. Uh, really excited to see that data come up, uh, updated um, this summer, hopefully. And uh, this weather normalization sheet that I was just showing you. So you can just click on that, it'll download. 
and it is free for you to use at your own risk. Please recognize um, that these are resources for you to take. They are not guarantees of savings. Um, and so um, we hope that you will use them. If you find er errors or pieces that need to be updated, give us that feedback and um, we, would, we would love to um, update them, fine tune them, create tools that are more useful for the building simulation community at large. Um, hopefully that provided some helpful tools for you to dive into on your own. Um, but I think it's important for us to just remember that um, it's in, we, we need our numbers to tell stories. Um, so let's, let's find compelling ways to do that instead of just um, boring tables and the usual pie chart. Um, it, at least add a few colors and make the data actionable so that when you do present it to somebody, they can quickly see that, oh, hey, the summer electricity use, uh, this is a, a lot higher than we were expecting. Maybe something's wrong with the chiller or you can start kind of identifying some of those things. All right, it looks like it's 1245. So I'm gonna stop talking now. Um, and Jason, would you be willing to launch the poll? Um, my computer's a bit slow at doing things like that. And I will monitor the chat and I'll hang out here for a few awkward Zoom minutes uh, for anybody that might have questions. So type it into the chat and or unmute yourself. Um, and I'd be happy to talk about these tools more. So thank you. I will say thanks again to IBIPSA um, and uh, look forward to partnering with them more. Um, it's, it's great to have more of a simulation community. I know we've got a good group here in Boise um, who's of course eligible to win prizes. So please fill out that poll um, so that we can get your data and get you some fun you know, LED lights or um, smart plugs uh, or some other um, goodies provided to you by Idaho Power. Um, Although Cushing Terrell, I think I think you guys won everything. So um, maybe not to you guys. We might do a semi-non-random drawing. We'll see. But normally it's a random drawing. Hey, That's Damon. Just, yeah. I had a quick question. Yep. Uh, first, thanks all for presenting. And I had a question on the the periods of time you're doing regressions on. It looked like most of the, the work in your tools uh, was based off of yearly data. Have you yeah. seen an effect of going to like more granular data on how that affects your models? Yes. Um, yes, so we do um, have uh, one that goes down into the hourly. We haven't gotten into sub hourly stuff. Um, well, I, I did for my PhD. Um, so I've got uh, one beast of a spreadsheet that I can share with you if you really need um, that helped me really calibrate down to um, sub meter data. Uh, at the five minute um, increment. Uh, that's probably overkill, uh, but we do have uh, an hourly um, sheet that I'm happy to send along. Um, I'll just say we're still kind of fine tuning some of the macros on it. Uh, so it's a little bit glitchy here and there, um, but you should be able to get a sense of what it's doing. Um, and and it, it is much harder to get some of those regressions out of it because you have so many more data points and it's harder to see those trends, but you can still get them. Um, and I think they still can be useful, um, especially if you're looking at a smaller time horizon. So say like over a month, um, if you're just getting a building up and going in terms of commissioning and things like that. Um, so yeah, Jason, feel free to send me an email and, and I can um, pass on that, that hourly spreadsheet to you if you want. Awesome, thank you, I appreciate it. Hey, Damon. Um, I missed when you were talking about that LAF tool. Was that, um, was that like a web-based 
or to, to generate um, an actual weather file or was it a, a plug into something else like Energy Plus or what was that again? Yeah, so it is a Python script actually. Um, you can just download it from GitHub um, from Java. Let me um, pull up. Here. I think I've got the PDF open. Let me just move it over to the correct screen. Um, and so um, it does provide kind of a, a web-based access. You can, I'm just you know, reading that top line. Um, I, I launched it and it comes up with a very simple screen that says, um, you know, download weather data, uh, here we go. This is what I want, as long as it shows up. Download TMY3, download weather data from Mesa West, or create your customized weather file. Um, it, on my computer, I had the little Java icon pop up, so I didn't need to run it directly off of Python, even though in their paper they recommend doing that. Um, it's a pretty easy download. They've got the GitHub link right here, um, and if you Google it, um, you can, you can find it as well, but it's just um, a student's PhD project. Um, so there, there are some limitations, but they mention that within this publication. Uh, and it's easy to uh, kind of create your own, if you will. Um, so it's, it's best if you start by downloading a TMY3 file. So like for Boise, you can download the Boise TMY3 file, and then you can select a couple columns within that and edit that data. So if you've got dry bulb temperature and relative humidity uh, coming in from NOAA or weather underground or something like that. You can copy and paste that in. So it's then going to adjust that weather file to that. And that's how you kind of create that, that customized file. The one downside, as I mentioned, is that um, it's not necessarily tied to solar radiation data. Um, that data can be kind of tough to get. You can find it from uh, University of Oregon. Um, they've, they've got a solar resource database for certain sites in the Northwest, but Boise is one of them. Okay, so thanks. Uh, just, just to confirm, it doesn't, um, it doesn't have access to the actual weather data. You need to furnish that yourself um, by, by going and getting it from, from NOAA or whatever. And then um, you can download it from this link. Okay, um, it so it, it's not say built into it. Um, so it is vulnerable as if those online sources go away. Um, but for now, it, it essentially functions as a click and it will import um, from online. Uh, so you don't need to go out on your own um, to get it. You can do it within the tool itself. Um, it's just, it's not pre-downloaded. It's just a, a click and it will go out and grab it. Got it. Thanks. Other questions? Thank you for filling out the poll. Appreciate it. Um, we like knowing who our audience is and how we can serve you better. If there's other topics that you'd like to see for 2022, um, let us know and uh, we take that um, to heart. The more recommendations we have, um, the more likely you are to get, get what you want. So uh, you can also just email that to us um, or uh, send us a message uh, and check out our website.